Hi, I'm Dr. Jack West, medical oncologist from Swedish Cancer Institute in Seattle, Washington, and I'm also the founder and president of GRACE, Global Resource for Advancing Cancer Education. And I'm happy to be here for a post-ASCO 2017 update with two of my colleagues. Uh, with me is Dr. Matt Gubins, who is uh, associate professor in medical oncology, specialist in thoracic oncology at the University of California, San Francisco, and Dr. Jyothi Patel, who is professor and in medical oncology at the University of Chicago in Chicago. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Let's talk about uh, immunotherapy, always an exciting field, and uh, it was a relatively surprising FDA approval to many of us in the field that uh, the FDA has, has now said we can give a combination of chemotherapy with carboplatin and olympta, amitrexid, along with keytruda, pembrolizumab, and immunotherapy to a broad range of patients with, uh, with non-squamous lung cancer. So that's most commonly adenocarcinoma, but squamous is about 20%. So the majority of patients could potentially receive this combination of chemo with immunotherapy up front. Uh, my sense is that many of us are not wholeheartedly endorsing or recommending this for the majority of our patients. And one other question is whether we should be doing testing for the predictive marker PDL1 anymore if it's not required. PDL1 can help us select which patients are most likely to benefit from immunotherapy. So Matt, what are your thoughts here and uh, you know, where do you see things going? As you know, immunotherapy has just come on fast and furious. And part of what we've had to handle as investigators, but also our patients, is how to reckon with all the data that are in front of us, what data are coming en route to us, and, uh, and, and where we go from there. The FDA makes decision based on what we call a phase two trial. Often when drugs are approved or combinations are approved, they're in a phase three with hundreds of patients. This was, I believe, 123 patients. So a fairly small number to make a big treatment decision based on. What the, what the trial showed was that in this smaller group of people, patients who got pembrolizumab or Keytruda on top of carbolimta had more likely a shrinkage of their disease and a longer time before their disease came back. The study wasn't designed to show, though, if the process of putting the treatments together, stacking them, I'd say, versus sequencing them, which would actually help people more in the long run. And just as we talked about for the targeted therapies, sequencing matters. And, and the question is, do patients get more benefit if you stack it? Stacking has its downsides too. Stacking does add some toxicity, some side effects. Fortunately, in the study, the combination of the three drugs, carbo, platin, olympta, and and Keytruda actually was decently well tolerated. It did add some side effects, some of the side effects we know that immune therapies cause, but um, it, it's something we have to really reckon with. I personally am hoping that we will soon get information from one of these bigger phase three trials. There is a phase three trial that was run concurrently, or almost concurrently, that has already gotten all the patients enrolled and we're just waiting for the final results. So we hope will happen in the next year because that will hopefully answer some of our questions about overall survival before we take on a really big policy decision of offering everybody this stacked treatment. So I'm, I'm being a little bit circumspect and holding back a bit. For now, my practice is still to do the pdl one testing, offer Keytruda to the patients who have 50% expression or higher, the folks- About 30% of the population. Right, 30% of the population where it has now been proven that patients who get that treatment first in that setting before chemotherapy live longer. Again, our gold standard in, in cancer care. Um, and for the other patients, for now I'm doing chemotherapy, knowing that as soon as chemotherapy stops working, they will go on immune therapy with Keytruda or Concentric or uh, uh, Apivo. Mm -hmm. um, and again, waiting for these trials to open up, or to, to, to report out their results. What about um, at ASCO, we did see an update of the previously published and really quite immature data on overall survival. Fortunately, most of these patients were alive and doing well, so it's a little hard to tell when these data were initially presented in late 2016. With several more months follow-up, there's a trend toward a survival difference. Does that change anything for you, or are you still inclined to say, it's a small study, we'll have much more data, let's just see. 
for me, I still want to wait for more data, but it certainly maybe it points the way toward what that bigger trial will show. Um, so I'm not quite ready to, to, to make that decision. Josie, you have a potentially different view on this. Well, so I um, absolutely agree that this was a, a large policy decision based on usually something that we think is, is a smaller data set. It's certainly exciting for patients. But because it's based on such a small set, it's going to be a, really hard for us to tease out which patients are going to be benefit the most from sort of the stacking or kitchen sink approach as to being maybe more restrained doing one drug at a time. Um, the studies that we don't have right now don't really, or that we don't have data from, don't really address whether if you're a candidate for upfront Keytruda, whether you do better with Keytruda alone or combination of free drugs. And that's a, a patient population that we need to look at because certainly one drug um, with minimal toxicity is certainly easier than three drugs at a time. And also from a societal perspective, it's also a lot cheaper doing one at a time. So that piece hopefully will will gain or will gain some insight with a larger phase three where we may not have enough patients to do some subset analysis. Um, at this juncture, patients who have high PDL1, I2, um, talk to about Kytruda. And certainly, you know, I, I think if a, if a patient's motivated and they understand our limited knowledge and all the problems with, with what we have, it's not, it, it's certainly reasonable to talk about chemotherapy plus Kytruda. What about, uh, you, you alluded to still testing. So in your mind, this doesn't obviate the value in testing up front if you know you can give it anyway? Right, so doing the test for pdl one is actually a, a pretty easy test. Um, so that's still an IHC test, and I'd like to know that up front. I think helps me. IHC is a is it's a, a protein test. test done on your tumor, and so most of us recommend that you get that protein test and diagnosis in addition to getting the molecular testing. And it's really both of those pieces of information that you need, in my mind, to to guide appropriate therapy. If you don't have enough tissue to do that protein test, and you probably don't have enough to do the genetic testing, which really should inform mm -hmm. treatment decisions. I'd make one extra point, too. You know, we were super excited to see that the Keytruda beats chemotherapy for that subset of 30% of patients who mm -hmm. had the high expression. But I, I don't want to convey the message that we can rest on our laurels. Even in that study that showed that those patients did better on Keytruda than chemotherapy, was still only about half of the population who actually had shrinkage of disease. Mm -hmm. So by no means am I saying we need to just rest on that, and that's why I really want these other data to come out and show us if that stacking approach really does impact not just response rate, but overall survival. But again, I always want to temper our enthusiasm and excitement about immune therapy with, with some of the realities of, of us not knowing yet exactly why it works in some people and not in others. So that's where that research is so important.